I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the 20th chapter, dealing with a very familiar parable of Jesus. You might want, uh, at least in the early part of the sermon, to keep your Bibles open because I'll actually be backing up a little bit and starting in the previous chapter to sort of set the stage for what's here in the 20th chapter. But for now, we'll read chapter 20 of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 1 through 16. Let us hear this word of the Lord. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came, and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? For the last will be first, and the first will be last. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord God, this is your word. So speak through your spirit what each of us needs to hear. Accomplish your purpose. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Imagine on the first day of class, your professor says, I have this very complicated math problem, the solution of which will determine your grade for the entire semester. I'm giving it to you now so you can start immediately if you hope to pass the course. And by the way, I want you all to get A's. You want to do well, so you get to work. Next day, you're in the library starting to work, and you go there day after day, and you notice not too many of the other students seem to be there working on it. As time goes on, you begin to hear some of them say, you know, I suppose I ought to get started, and you figure, well, that's their problem. I'm, I'm underway. About midway through the semester, and some of them say, you know, I think I better take a harder look, because I haven't put much time in on it, and you just sort of shake your head and wish them well. Finally, it comes the week of exams. You're nearing that final class, and you're putting the finishing touches on your problem, and You're hearing some say, you know, maybe with a couple all-nighters, I I might get lucky and get it done. And then the day comes. It's the last day of class. You walk in and proudly hand the professor the problem. It's solved. It's all set and done. But then you realize all the other students in the class have turned it in and have it done successfully as well. And then you begin to hear comments. One says, Professor, thanks for helping me figure this out last week. I, I, I couldn't have done it without your help. Still another said, here it is, professor, all done. Thanks for your kind help yesterday. Still another one says, thanks for coming by the dorm last night to help me. I couldn't have done it without you. And suddenly you feel miffed. You're not so sure what has all taken place. Here you would put yourself into it, and meanwhile, the professor was running around the campus helping everybody, everybody but you, that is. And and so you're frustrated, and you you speak to the, the professor, and you tell her what you think. 
she says, why do you begrudge my generosity? The goal of the class is to get people to finish the problem. You were able to finish it on your own. Congratulations, that's wonderful. But the others needed a little special attention. You get an A, they get an A. What's wrong with that? Am I not doing you right? Let me ask you something. Can you live with grace? Jesus' parable that we just read presents, I think, a very disturbing problem. Now, to understand the context, we need to kind of go back into that 19th chapter. And there at verse 16, we, we find that the parable is said in the context of grace. Verse 16 of the 19th chapter is that familiar story, the rich young man who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him the basic commandments, and the young man says, I, I have followed and obeyed all of those. And then Jesus says in verse 21, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Then Matthew adds this comment. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And then Jesus turned and addressed the disciple, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Stunned and perhaps somewhat shaken, the disciples then asked if, if a rich young man like this cannot be saved, who then can be? Jesus simply says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And that prompted Peter to ask this question. Lord, we have left everything, verse 27, to follow you. What then will there be for us? So Jesus here in this parable is dealing with the issue of rewards. The disciples were wondering what was in it for them. And part of Jesus' answer was to share this parable, a parable of grace, about those who worked all day and were upset because at the end of the day, they didn't feel they got what they deserved in comparison with what others got. I have a hunch most of us have been there more than once in our lives. I know I have. In fact, my mind goes back to the high school my senior year. I tried out for the male solo part in the annual variety show. Everyone knew I was a cinch to make it. After all, I was in the state honors choir. I was in the honors quartet. I had soloed before. But I didn't make it. Make matters worse, the guy who made it had never soloed before, and he actually sang a little flat, and they not only gave him the solo, but they asked him to MC the entire night. I was not a very happy camper. In my mind, he did nothing to deserve it. I did everything. Have you ever felt that way? One of our sons, not named Brian, spent a week at a soccer camp learning how to be a better goalie. And it was a great week for him, and he was really learning how to do it and was looking forward to, to being the number one goalie on the high school team. By the end of the summer, he was ready to go. And then just a week or two before the season started, another player on the soccer team who admitted he was only on the team because he wanted to stay in shape for tennis, which was his sport, went up to the coach and said, you know, I think I'd like to play goalie. He got to start the first game of the season. Somehow they didn't seem quite fair. What had he done to deserve it? Was the coach playing favorites? Hmm. Ever been there? Or maybe you were with the company for several years and you put in all the overtime, gotten rave reviews and knew you were in line for a promotion. But there was this new person recently hired, just graduated not too long ago and not a whole lot of experience, but they knew how to sweet talk and manipulate everyone and you soon found out that they were hired in at the same pay rate that you currently have, and lo and behold, they get the promotion. And you know it's not right. You know it's unjust. It just isn't fair. You should be getting the recognition. Ever felt like that? Or you've attended church and Sunday school all your life. You were a leader in the youth group. You sang in the worship team. You pretty much did it all. And then that that tough guy, that bully who lived down the street from church. He met Jesus and got saved. 
And everybody swarmed around him. They, they drool over him. And they even asked him in numerous settings to share his story. And you began to feel like nobody really cared about you. I mean, who's drooling over you? And when have you been asked to share your story? It just didn't seem quite fair that he was getting all the attention you feel you deserve. Or there's that irreverent, rascally person who constantly ridiculed you because of your faith who all of a sudden received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior on his deathbed, just in time to be ushered into heaven. And you remember Jesus' words from Luke 15, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And you want to rejoice and be exceeding glad, but there's a part of you that says, you know, that just doesn't seem quite fair. So I raise the question tonight, can you live with grace? It seems to me the parable reveals a troubling scenario. According to Jesus, those who worked all day felt they didn't get what they deserved because everyone, no matter how long they worked, received the same pay. Now remember, Jesus is talking here about grace, and so what that means for those who heard him was that he treats everybody the same. The pay is equal. The rewards are the same no matter when grace takes over your life. If we're honest, that doesn't seem quite fair, does it? At least it upsets the normal, the unexpected. I mean, Jesus calls for effort, right? Doesn't he say, lay down your life, take up your cross daily, follow me, forget your family, look at, look at me only? He demands that, and yet, and yet they get in almost for free. After all, we worship every week, maybe twice, maybe three times. We give faithfully, we, we pray regularly, we serve diligently, we live good, clean, biblical, moral lives. Surely, surely that must be worth something. And then we read the workers who were hired about the 11th hour came, and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. To be honest, that is disturbing. Certainly those day-long workers thought so. So they staged a protest. They, they told the master he was wrong. I mean, what kind of system rewards very little labor with that system of reward, why work 12 hours when I can work one hour and, and make the same amount? Whatever happened to hard, long, faithful, loyal labor? And Jesus, why should I try so hard now to be a good Christian if I can get the same reward by getting serious later in life? Can you live with grace? We have difficulty living with grace, I think, because of the spirit that was among those workers. Three different kinds of spirit I find here. The first is the bargaining spirit. You see it in verse 2 and then at verse 13. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. And then at the end of the day, he says, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Those day-long workers had entered into a relationship with the master only on the basis of a negotiated agreement. They were in the relationship for what they could get out of it. They will be duly rewarded, but will receive only what they asked for. It seems to me that begs the question, what bargains have you negotiated with God? God, if only you, then I'll. God, if, if only you'll heal me, my spouse, my child, my brother, my sister, my friend. God, if only you'll help me get this promotion. God, if only you'll help me pass this test. God, if only you'll help me score a goal or make that basket. God, if only you'll find Mr. Wright for me. God, if only then I promise I'll be more faithful in attending worship. 
I'll give more. I'll pray more. I'll rededicate my life to you. Just what do you expect from him? And what do you think you've earned? Be careful. Watch out for the bargaining spirit because you may not be able to live with grace. There's also the begrudging spirit. Verses 11 and 12. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. They were not so much discontent with their pay, they got what they bargained for. Truth is, they were more disturbed and discontent with the master's generosity to others. Whenever we enter into a relationship for what we can get out of it, we will seldom, if ever, be satisfied. In fact, we'll quickly become jealous and discontent. Remember the older son in the parable of the prodigal? He seems to me have been very content with everything he had until his younger brother went out and wasted his inheritance and came home and his dad threw him a party. And suddenly he was all discontent and felt that he wasn't getting what he deserved, at least in comparison with his brother. And what about the religious leaders to whom Jesus often spoke gruffly? He even told them that he hadn't come for, for their sakes, but for the lost, for those outside the fold. He even implied that the tax collectors and harlots would enter the kingdom before them. Whew. That sounds like a raw deal, doesn't it? You see, it's okay to receive a care package on my doorstep, but when my neighbor receives the same package, mine tends to lose a little bit of value. Just why are you in relationship with Jesus? Be careful of the begrudging spirit because you may not be able to live with grace. And then in verse 10, we find the third spirit. So when those came who were hired first, and here's the phrase, they expected to receive more. They had a boastful spirit. They were worth more. In comparison with the other workers, they were more deserving. They were better. Just like the Pharisees knew they were better than the publicans and the Jews knew they were better than the Gentiles, they didn't like being put on equal standing and equal footing with those less responsible, not so deserving workers. Just like at some point in time you may have felt like you're more deserving than so-and-so when it comes to such-and-such. Surely equal standing with them is, is a step downward on the social scale. Watch out for the boastful spirit because you may not be able to live with grace. So just what is Jesus teaching here? What are the divine principles he's trying to instill within his disciples and within us? Look first at verse 15. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Jesus is teaching us that God is sovereign. The vineyard belongs to him. He has a right to do with it what he wants to, to hire whomever he wants, to pay them whatever he wants. It's all up to him. It's his right. In the 18th chapter of Genesis, Abraham was pleading for God to spare the city of Sodom. And he ends his prayer this way in the 25th chapter of Genesis 18. Will not the judge or will not the ruler of all the earth do right? Abraham knew that God will do right. He sets the standards. It is his right. For he is sovereign. It is his world. The Apostle Paul certainly caught that spirit. Such a wonderful passage in the 9th chapter of Romans beginning in verse 14. Paul wrote, shall we say then that God is unjust? Not at all. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on anyone I wish. I will take pity on anyone I wish. So then everything depends not on what we humans want or do, 
but only on God's mercy. For the scripture says to the king of Egypt, I made you king in order to use you to show my power and to spread my fame over the whole world. So then, God has mercy on anyone he wishes, and he makes stubborn anyone he wishes. But one of you will say to me, if this is so, how can God find fault with anyone? Who can resist God's will? But who are you, my friend, to talk back to God? A clay pot does not ask the man who made it, why did you make me like this? After all, the man who makes the pots has the right to use the clay as he wishes and to make two pots from the same lump of clay, one for special occasions and one for ordinary use. And then he says, and the same is true of what God has done. God is sovereign, and he chooses to operate by grace and treat all of us equally. He has mercy on whom he will have mercy. That's his right. We don't call or choose God. He calls and chooses us. He chooses us not because he can't get along without us, but because we can't get along without him. It's not about us. It's about him. The question is, can you live with grace? God is sovereign. We learn secondly that God is sensitive. Verse 14. I want to give to the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. He was concerned about those who needed the wages, especially those nearing the end of the day and had no wages. So Jesus is saying, out of grace, God is generous. Just as, by the way, he was concerned about and generous with me as he was with you when he chose and called us. Do we deserve grace more than anyone else? We will never live with joy and contentment if we focus more on God's prohibitions than we do in His provisions. If we think more about what we think we deserve and what we think we lack than, in fact, about what we have. If we focus more on the provisions of others, we will fail to see the mercy that God has extended to us. And we will never live with contentment and joy. Can you live with grace? God is sensitive. And then the third parable is that God is searching. For the kingdom of God is like a landowner who went out early in the morning. About the third hour he went out. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour. <clears throat> about the eleventh hour he went out and found still others. The landowner needed others to help harvest the vineyard. God doesn't really need us to help harvest the vineyard. And yet he's always on the way, inviting us and calling us. Why? Because he loves us and he wants us to have the joy and the blessing of serving in his kingdom. But until he calls, we're just standing around. There's, there's nothing to do to get called. We wait, but then at every opportunity, we see it as a gift of grace, no matter when it comes, early or late in the day. In fact, when the call comes is not important. That it comes at all is the amazing thing. How long we serve is not the most important that we serve when called is what is critical. The perceived amount of reward or grace is not important. That we recognize grace is what counts the most. So how about it? Can you live with grace? Many of us here were called long ago early in the daytime of our lives. And we've been laboring in the kingdom for many years. Let's not look at anything or anyone but the cross. Forbid it, Lord, that we should boast, save in the death of Christ our God. Were the whole realm of nature ours, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, 
so divine demands our souls, our lives, our all. Let us live and rejoice in grace. Perhaps some of you were called later in the day of your lives. Faith, faith age-wise, you're younger. Maybe you wish you had been called earlier, but you've been called. So go hard all the way. Put the crisis years behind and make these Christ-filled years to be full of joy. Live and rejoice in grace. Perhaps some of you are still waiting to be called. Keep showing up, looking for Jesus, because he's looking for you. Perhaps even right now, he's calling you. And when you hear him call, respond. Before his work is done, and he calls no more. May each of us live the rest of our lives in grace. To that end, let us pray. Lord God, we've sung about it, we've read about it, we've heard about it, and we truly are grateful for grace. For where would we be without it? But we know, Lord, it's hard to live with grace because sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. And in those moments, we need to remember your wonderful grace in our lives. We need not cheapen his death on the cross, but let it bear its fruit in the lives of others and rejoice when they rejoice. Lord, continue to teach us of grace. Continue to remind us of grace. And Holy Spirit, enable us to live richly in grace. Wherever we are, whatever the time of the day of our lives, Lord, when you call, may we answer. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.